what we tend to do to people in the academy is overdevelop one aspect of our humanity, and that's the productive capacities. And that is simply not fully human. I am so pleased to introduce our panelists for tonight, starting with Jason Baer. Jason is professor of philosophy at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles. From 2012 to 2015, Jason directed the Intellectual Virtues and Education Project at LMU, which involved the founding of the Intellectual Virtues Academy of Long Beach. His newest book out of Harvard Education Press is Deep in Thought, a practical guide to teaching for intellectual virtues. Jason, welcome. We're also joined by Lisa Jeremka, Associate Professor in Psychology at the University of Delaware, alumni talking here, go Blue Hens, where she directs a close relationships and health lab. Lisa's research aims to understand how feeling socially disconnected affects health. And recently she's been exploring issues, awareness and solutions around burnout, rejection and imposter syndrome, things a lot of us have, have been struggling with and experiencing in, in the last 18, 19 months. Her recent piece runs with a fantastic title, Common Academic Experiences No One Talks About, Repeated Rejection, Imposter Syndrome, and Burnout. Welcome, Lisa. And finally, Margarita Muni Suarez is Associate Professor of Congregational Studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, where her work lies at the intersection of the social sciences with philosophy and theology. In 2016, Margarita founded the Scala Foundation, which is dedicated to infusing meaning and purpose into American education by restoring a classical liberal arts education. Her newest book out of Clooney Media is The Love of Learning, Seven Dialogues on the Liberal Arts. And glad to have you with us, Margarita. So let's dive in. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'd like to get right into it and say that academic pressure is real for good and for ill. Uh, it certainly drives our research and our continually in innovating classrooms. But I, I know that all of us have experienced negative repercussions from the need to perform and produce in, in certain ways. So I'd love to spend a few minutes first just really taking a hard look at our professional lives as academics before turning to how we can address it more, more holistically. So uh, first question that I'd love each of you to sort of respond with uh, on, on your own. We'll start with Lisa. Uh, how have you seen the pandemic change? our academic lives, whether your own or the lives of, of, of those around you. And Lisa first, and then we'll have Margarita and Jason respond as well. Yeah, thanks. So super excited to be here and to talk about this important topic. You know, I think it's a useful in answering that to think about what were our lives like before the pandemic, if we can even remember <laughs> the time when that existed. And, you know, I think at that time, people were already, experiencing a lot of burnout. So, you know, when I first got involved in, in writing and thinking about burnout, talking to colleagues, talking to people in workshops that I was hosting, the burnout levels were already really high. I think partially driven by people's like internal pressure to succeed, perfectionism, you know, internal drives, partially driven by the external environment and the high expectations placed upon academics. And so, you know, all those things together, I think, led to these really high levels of burnout. And then we add into it, uh, hopefully once in a lifetime pandemic, an unprecedented, you know, external stressor. And that I think for so many academics and so many people, non-academics included, really just sent people over the edge. Burnout levels, I think are at an all time high. And we can see, I'm working on a review paper right now about the impact of the pandemic on mental health and on loneliness and belonging more generally. And the main theme is that this isn't exclusive to academics. This is people in general, including academics, except for a very small respite during 2020, um, summer 2020, it's had a really significant negative impact on people's mental health, on their sense of belonging, on their sense of loneliness, especially younger people, people with young children, women, underrepresented minorities, you know, some people have been, <clears throat> I think, particularly affected. And I would anticipate that those findings um, from lots and lots of studies that I'm reviewing would apply to academics as well. So I guess long story short, it has not affected 
things in a positive way. Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm I'm in turn deeply saddened by 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 this reality that the pandemic has just exacerbated and made things worse and people are really struggling and not 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 hopeful, but there's a weird kind of assurance that the pandemic didn't break you. It didn't lead to new horrible habits of heart and mind. These things we're struggling with in academia have been longstanding issues in higher education that you were seeing before the pandemic. And it's easy to think, oh, we all got shut up in our homes. We had our lives uh, disrupted and suddenly I'm more self-aware of the stresses on me and there must be something wrong with me because there's more, there's more of me in my life. <laughs> and, and suddenly things are going great. Well, it, it, it might be that there are longstanding issues in higher ed that we can talk about as well. Um, it's great. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I mean, I totally agree. Yeah. Cool. Margarita, what about for you? Well, one of the classes I teach in an area of my research is actually on resilience, suffering, and vulnerability. And I think what I saw during the pandemic, one, we actually are pretty resilient, right? We were capable of adapting. We moved online. A lot of people showed an incredible adaptability given the really rapid conditions that were changing all the time. Mm -hmm. At the same time, right, like these trends are often not unidirectional. We also saw really extreme cases of burnout and suffering and loss of purpose and disorientation. So what I try to see the positive side, I think the discussion we're having tonight is an example of how the pandemic brought to light the tensions in the academic life between teaching and research and service and how so often, as Lisa said, we're already doing these things in isolation without a strong sense of community. And I think that the lack of community has been really a mitigating factor to how people were able to respond to the ever-changing, really rapidly changing circumstances that we all faced. So I mean, I started Scala five years ago, you know, to try to bring back some of these fundamental questions about education and linking it to meaning and purpose and community, precisely because I was worried about burnout among students and teachers. So the opportunity I see because of the pandemic is now everybody's asking these questions. And I think that there's, I, I hate to say it, but I think that there is an inherent tension between all of the things that we aim to do in our careers and balancing that with our personal lives. And now we've got to face that. And I think that's where the creativity comes in. Um, and hopefully those are some of the things, some of the big questions that I think are now being asked right, that in order to really sustain a vocation to the academic life, I believe the academic life is a beautiful vocation, but to sustain that requires practices and communities and a shared narrative about why we're doing this and who we're serving. But at the end of the day, I believe that the life of the mind is a vocation in teaching students is a vocation because every human person is unique and irrepeatable. And we have this amazing opportunity to shape the lives of others by creating new knowledge with them. And mm -hmm. I find that that commitment to vocation is what has sustained me, but learning how to not myself become burned out because that spills out into everything else, if that's what I'm doing. That's been the challenge for me during the pandemic is how to respond to the quick changing circumstances, respond to everybody's greater needs without that ruining the heart and soul of why I do what I do. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for that, Margarita. Yeah, it's it's so interesting to hear, uh, definitely not contradictory statements from Lisa and Margarita, but but definitely emphasizing that there is a need to authentically look at the real stress and systemic issues that we're facing and to focus and be engaged in our calling or our vocation or, or why we do the things that we do. And so, so often academia, this was an experience I had for 15 years, academia sort of promotes this kind of keep your head down, keep, keep the work going, keep producing. And that's neither nor the sort of the stress and you're trying not to look at it too hard. And somewhere in the back of your mind, there's a reason for doing what you do, right? But you're both showing us how to look really at, at the, uh, the spectrum that you're on in a given day. 
Jason, curious for your thoughts as well. Thanks, Kyle. And I, I don't feel like I have a whole lot to add. I think Lisa and Margarita have, 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 painted, have painted a pretty full and, and accurate picture. The, the, the only thing I'll, I'll mention has to do with, um, or is connected to the, the title of tonight's panel related to intellectual character. And um, it, the discussion makes me think of intellectual humility in, in particular. Um, I think one of the things that, that we've experienced in the pandemic is, is an increasing um, set of, a new set of, of limitations, including limitations on our intellectual lives and our intellectual activity. And for, for people um, like many academics who are inclined toward uh, perfectionism and are very driven, um, we have a hard time um, accepting limitation. And so I think that, I, I think for me, the, 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 pandem the pandemic has been an opportunity, sort of an invitation and a challenge to um, confront and accept some of my own uh, intellectual limitations, which is how I think of, of, of intellectual humility. Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 go there. I'm curious to hear more about this. I mean, one study conducted during the pandemic found that something like just just south of 50 percent of surveyed faculty had considered leaving higher ed because of how the pandemic had had just exacerbated, uh, as Lisa mentioned, job pressures that had existed already. Uh, and I think just just north of that had also said that they they strongly agreed that the job was more was more difficult and. For many of us, the response was work more, work harder, um, just try to keep up. And Jason, you're, you're telegraphing a message here that is more about limits and humility. So talk to us about intellectual character. How, how do you define uh, humility and the other terms in that constellation? And how, how would you have us as panelists and, and our listeners thinking about intellectual character and, and what it means for us day to day. Sure. So, so a very, very general definition or, or characterization of, of intellectual character might just be um, our, our personal character as it manifests in and relates to distinctively epistemic activities and pursuits, truth seeking, um, knowledge acquisition, um, um, uh, teaching. Um, and, and so our character doesn't just bear on our lives as, as neighbors or as citizens, um, it also bears on and manifests in our intellectual activities. Um, another slightly more um, specific way to think about intellectual character is, is our disposition, how, how we're disposed to act and think and feel in the context of pursuing knowledge and refining knowledge and transmitting knowledge. And if you think about intellectual character in that way, um, it's a neutral concept or construct. It can be better or worse. Um, and so I think of intellectual virtues as strengths of intellectual character. And I think um, um, intellectual humility is one important intellectual virtue among many, and that it does have to do with our relationship to our intellectual limitations and mistakes. Um, um, are we resistant to those? Uh, do, do, we, do we hide them from others? Do we get defensive um, when, when, when they become apparent? Or are we able and willing to own or accept or take responsibility for those limitations? So that's how I'm thinking about intellectual humility. And again, I, 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 it's possible to go too far with it, um, to be excessively intellectually humble. Um, and, th and that's not a virtue, but neither is an absence of intellectual humility, such as intellectual um, arrogance. Right. I'm, I'm curious to hear as well, these words, humility and, and, and virtues and values, to what extent are these things that, that we need to, to put in time to work on and the fruits of, of, of working towards these virtues are, are not gonna be apparent for a little while because humans take time to change. And to what extent are you talking about postures and small things we can, we can wake up and say, I'm gonna practice intellectual humility by revisiting my to-do list for the day, that, that, that sort of thing. 
well, should I go ahead and answer that or, or do we, we want to bring someone else in or? Uh, Margarita just unmuted. So I'd love, yeah, if you want to yeah, step please. in. Yeah. Well, just on this topic of this discussion, yeah. when I was in graduate school and asking myself these kind of big questions, somebody told me to read John Henry Newman's The Idea of a University. Mm -hmm. And that's now one of the kind of texts that inspires Scala's foundational class on educational philosophy. But what I took away from that is that it's incredibly important to practice the intellectual virtues of integrity, truth seeking, knowing your limitations, humility, and sort of the cardinal sin of academics is a lack of humility, right? Um, and there's something good about that because we're passionate about what we want to know. But as I've taught Newman's book and taught other people who've written about the life of the mind as a vocation, I think sometimes alongside the intellectual virtues, what I think the pandemic helped me see is that the cultivation of the moral life is at the center of what a university was founded to be, right? Mm. And the moral life includes the virtues of charity, you know, love of neighbor. It includes, you know, the, the love of truth as, an, as a revelation of kind of what is the world, like as a receptivity to the world. And frankly, also, the, you know, the desire for holiness, prayer, worship, you know, I'm a person of faith in the university in many ways, was originally about the integration of the life of the mind and the life of prayer and worship. And I think during the pandemic that that separation was almost forced because so many things had been shut. But what I think is so powerful is that when the intellectual virtues are practiced and our students and our colleagues know that that a meaningful life, a purposeful life is a moral life, right? And people have a different understanding of how to practice that moral life, but we are moral. We are fundamentally moral believing human beings who have a capacity for reason to know the world we're created in, but we're not only creatures of reason. So that's part of the humility and that's part of our limitations that we need to nurture our souls. And I think when education and research is done in that way, when I go back to that central mission, that's where the curiosity and the awe and the creativity come. Because if not, I just, not only do I lose the kind of intellectual virtues of humility, I can just start to function a little bit more like a robot when I'm not carefully cultivating my own moral intuitions and sensibilities and desires. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to throw a question out there and Margarita, feel free to take the lead, but anyone else as well, to what extent are, are, are you talking about cultivating these values in the personal walk of an individual instructor sort of as, as against the expectations and incentives that the university is always piling on us and to what extent are you describing something that can also be inculcated into departmental culture or as something that is also signaled back to uh, especially new hires and incoming individuals who, are, who are, are piecing together a sense for what this university and what this discipline expects of me? I mean, I'll just say briefly, and then I want to let the others respond as well. I would say briefly that you can never bypass the personal vocation, the personal mission, right? Because we are fundamentally individuals and we have moral character and we need to constantly be cultivating our personal vocation. Now, the practical ways that I have done this, and I, I, I think anybody listening can do this and they will automatically have an impact on their environment, even if they only do this for themselves, because we bring ourselves into our department meetings, into our classrooms, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And people sense they have an intuition about where we're coming from and why we're doing what we're doing. But that said, I firmly believe in community. So when I was a junior professor, I started a discussion group for graduate women. It was a peer mentorship group with me sort of as the moderator. And that went on for years. When I was living in an undergraduate dorm at Yale, I started a reading group on happiness and we met over dinner with dinner provided, right? So in every environment I've been in, I've sought to create little platoons of people who come together to, to share and to support each other. Now through Scala, I do this on a much more organized level, precisely because I think we need more of this. But anybody can do this without changing anything in their environment. Changing yourself is going to change your environment. And two, forming small communities of people, you know, joining up with heterodox and doing it, finding the opportunities that are out there or just starting it yourself will 
I think those small actions will build up. Look, we could talk about structural change from top down. I would love to see that. I would love to see different university policies, department policies. Maybe those exist somewhere, but any of us can do the steps that I'm that I'm talking about at any mm -hmm. time, I believe. Yeah, yeah. I'm hearing another intellectual virtue here, which is curiosity as well, that this requires finding people who you want to get together with and pursue ideas and talk vocation and talk deeper meaning, why we do what we do uh, and how that can that can infuse our, our outlooks. That's great. Yeah, if I could kind of add to that, because, you know, the idea of how much can we personally change versus how much does the mm -hmm. system need to change, I think is something that I think about a lot. And I really struggle in these conversations about intellectual, intellectual humility and thinking about that because the reality of academic culture for most people is that we're not rewarded for being humble, right? That to get our papers published, we have to talk about all the ways in which our study was great and all of the, the wonderful things it's gonna demonstrate. To get a grant, we have to talk about the groundbreaking work that we're doing and how great it's gonna to be to get that award we need to get tenured. Let's brag a little more about myself. You know, the, <laughs> the reality of the structure is that, that I don't know if there's space, especially for junior scholars, I would say, especially for junior scholars to be, you know, par participating in the environment in a way in which they're de demonstrating humility, because that's not how we're typically rewarded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I you know, Jason, I, I want to leave your chance to speak as well, but Lisa, actually, I want to drill down on that for a minute. I mean, as the resident psychologist of the space, uh, you know, someone who's who's pursuing, be, you know, the, the behavioral sciences and is looking at burnout and imposter syndrome and it's, it's sort of biological effects on us, where has this conversation dovetailed with the sorts of solutions and approaches that, that you have seen or think are viable and where has it, where has it departed from them? I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, sort of where solutions sit in your mind as, as a scientist? Yeah, I mean, I do think of solutions falling into those two categories of the changes that we can personally make, but those can only get us so far and that the mm -hmm. system and the, and the culture that we're in also needs to change. And so I do think whether we're talking about humility or whatever it might be, that it's the solution, I think, fundamentally comes down to both of those things changing. And Often the way that I think about it is, let's say with burnout, for example, I think a lot of the, the long-term solution to burnout is academic culture changing. But then the question is, what do we do in the meantime? How do we maintain our sanity? How do we cope with the realities of what our life, you know, what academic culture currently is until it changes? Mm -hmm. And so it's the, the combination of those two things, I think that's really important. Yeah, yeah. I'm just noodling with so many questions, so many thoughts right now about where to start. Um, Jason, you you've spoke so eloquently about intellectual humility and how that can help us control what we think we can accomplish in a day. And I'd love to hear you respond to to Lisa's point about what that means for junior faculty and what other virtues and 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 elements of intellectual character. Uh, have you sought to instill in, in your academy and, and do you think are also worth practicing and pursuing? Yeah, um, right. Uh, Lisa, I appreciate your point. And, and I want to um, just emphasize that, you know, which virtues are, are relevant to a given situation and the form that those virtues take is a, is a variable matter. It, it, it can vary from one person to another, depending on things like, well, what, what point are you at in your career? I think your, your comments also just remind us that there are other virtues that complement and constrain um, uh, it, humility, things like intellectual courage, or even a kind of proper pride in one's work, a kind of intellectual autonomy. Um, I don't think I'd go so far as to say that that junior faculty members um, uh, don't need intellectual humility at all, because certainly intellectual arrogance can 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 get them into trouble. Um, and then again, I want to say just in terms of kind of personal well-being, 
and perfectionism, right? That we, we many of us are 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 kind of enculturated with uh, 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 to have perfectionistic tendencies and to want to always transcend our limitations and to avoid mistakes. And I think not always, but often in that is an unhealthy um, resistance to our, our, our limitations. And, and Kyle, to, to quickly uh, circle back to, to something you said before about sort of what it might look like for, for us as individuals to, to try to pursue or, or, or practice um, intellectual humility. I'll just say that, that in my own case, I think to the extent that I've managed to um, make some peace with my intellectual limitations, uh, that that it's been a kind of indirect route, and it, and it relates interestingly, I think, Margarita, to some things you were saying. So the the Latin root of humility is is humus, which means ground or earth, and I think another way of thinking about humility as is as being grounded. We're not trying to be perfect. We're not trying to transcend all of our all of our limitations. That we're that we are that we're appropriately um, grounded. And, and so it, in my pursuit of that kind of groundedness, it's looked like um, developing deep relationships and friendships, um, being involved in a, in a close community of other friends and, and, and families. I'm not gonna generalize on this for everybody else, but that's been one for me also, um, a kind of spiritual practices um, and, and, and engagement have been important. Um, I'll also throw therapy out there as um, one way of learning to um, make peace with with some of our with some of our our limitations. And finally, um, for me, um, I found service um, service to to be helpfully grounding, um, whether that's with folks struggling with mental illness or or homelessness. Um, I'll just say, and, and this, this, may, this may call you to question my own moral motivation for this kind of thing, but I'll just say, I am grounded by being around people that aren't striving to transcend all of their limitations. Um, so so that, that again, I, I've been involved with the Long, Long Beach Rescue Mission um, and I am grounded by being in that place because um, I'm surrounded. I'm not surrounded by perfectionists. I'm not surrounded by people who are doing everything they can to not make a mistake or to transcend their limitations. So it's interesting that that those sorts of indirect um, practices and measures might be a way of helping us become more grounded, which can translate even into our own intellectual um, lives and, and endeavors. Mm. When you describe service and, and family and community, uh, you know, Jason, maybe you can start and then Lisa and Margarita, I'd love to hear your experiences as well. Uh, how, how easy has it been for you to find that within the walls of academia? And to what extent are you describing something that is that is outside and giving you giving you fuel to renew and refresh for the work of you know what Lisa describes as a as a junior faculty member who just has little opportunity to do anything but produce, right? So where where are you finding that? For me, it has largely been outside of academia. I mean, I have some wonderful colleagues and friends who are kind of part of that part of that story. Um, but for me, it's, pri it's primarily been, been a part of that through longstanding relationships and friends of friends and, mm -hmm. um, but a commitment, yeah, a commitment to nurturing community and friendship um, ha has been a big part of it for me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would say with regards to this larger topic, I mean, I just did want to mention that when I was a junior faculty member and was, um, I, I was actually denied tenure. And I think for anyone who's an academic, I mean, I thought that was extremely unfair. At the same time, it also provoked the biggest kind of imposter syndrome you could ever have, right? Like everything I had dedicated my life to was now judged as deficient. I mean, it was devastating. Mm -hmm. And 
what people, what often happens in the academy is we only look at, people only look at my accomplishments. People now only see that I have tenure at a different institution in a different field. I, I switched fields. So I think what I would encourage people who are listening to do who are in graduate school, like, or even in the tenure track or even have tenure, one of the problems with the academy is that we supposedly have a lot of freedom because it comes after tenure, but people feel unfree because they feel like they have no other path other than this one thing that's prescribed for them. So what I hear Jason saying, or when I listen to what Jason's saying, I think it's really important to have friends outside of the academy and to build personal as well as professional networks outside of the academy. Because what ends up happening, I think, is that the academy can become very, very insular. And we only talk to people who have personalities like us, which are extremely ambitious because to become an academic there's a lot of ambition and that can be a good thing. There can be a right understanding of pride as Jason mentioned, but yet we tend to associate with people who are wired to be ambitious, rational, go-getting types. And so when things like being denied tenure happen or you just need someone to have a different perspective on life. Um, and so I have really cultivated those friendships as well through groups in which I, I aim to serve other people, communities of faith, and I've also tried to create little microcosms of those groups within the academy. Um, but now that I have recovered my career and do have tenure and run a nonprofit, I think there's also a risk of, of burnout from success in the academy because success in the academy breeds more responsibility um, and more expectation and more talks to give and more places to be and more people to share your story with, right? So you never get out of it. This idea that I want young people who or people who are not yet tenured to hear is that it is not a walk in the park once you've crossed that barrier to tenure because the expectations go up. So this advice that you're getting from us about cultivating a life outside of the academy, finding balance, being grounded, serving other people, growing in moral virtues, love and charity, those are the lessons that you're gonna need whether your career is going great or it's going poorly. Simply because what we tend to do to people in the academy is over develop one aspect of our humanity and that's the productive capacities and that is simply not fully human hmm. fascinating um lisa as as director of the close relationships and 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 health lab uh, i i know that you're you're working on a lot of different things but you know i've seen friendship listed as well in your in your materials uh are you studying sort of generalized relationships within higher ed, without higher ed? I'm curious where your head's at right now as, as we talk about the need for close relationships as, as, yeah. as a way to push back. Yeah. I mean, this is a topic I've been studying for 15 or so years. Yeah. And, you know, everything that Jason and Margarita are talking about resonates so much with the research on the topic that we as human beings need to feel like we belong. We need to feel like people care about us. And then we're connected to other people. It's a fundamental aspect of what it means to be a human being. Like we need that just like we need air to breathe and we need food to eat. Mm -hmm. And so the data so strongly supports, you know, not just my work, but lots and lots and lots of work supports this idea that that sense of connection is so fundamental for our mental health, our physical health. I mean, it's just, again, it's, it's a critical part of what it means to be a human being. Mm -hmm. In your research and experiences, do you advocate for people really trying to build that in higher ed when they can? I guess, I, Lisa, you're, so you're, you're one who has who, a voice in this room who has been in, in really great ways more critical of, of how long and how hard it's going to take to fix a lot of these things. Uh, and I think that's such a, that realist perspective is so essential as we build up expectations for, for when to expect to see change. Um, where do you think higher ed is at with, with cultivating places where the, the sorts of friendships and close relationships you're, you're studying are, are possible? And what would you suggest if you could change something structurally tomorrow that, that would, would, would create more healthy relationships in higher ed, what would it be? You know, what, what are you driving at? Um, that you'd like to see around you as, as a professional in higher ed? Yeah, that is a really great and difficult question. I mean, I think 
gosh, there's like a million things that I would think about changing. You know, I think important context is I just went through the tenure process myself. And, mm. you know, for anyone who's been there, you know, be, being a, a junior faculty member going through the tenure process is very difficult, even if ultimately it's successful, which my case was, everything was fine. It's just <laughs> such, such, such an intensely stressful process that I feel like a lot of my current, um, maybe slightly negative views might be driven by the fact that this is the this is where I am in my career right now right that maybe five years from now I will feel differently or maybe not I'm not sure but that could definitely be a component and so when I think about what I would change it really I, I come back to thinking about this tenure process and the incredible stress that it places junior faculty under and how you know, I don't know what the solution to that is. I don't know what the change that needs to happen is, but these, the the ever ever higher increasing bar that junior faculty have to meet. You know, what you would get tenured with ten years ago wouldn't even get you a job. You know, now like the bar is just increasing, increasing, increasing. It's unsustainable, and I don't really know how to fix that. Honestly, I don't have a great answer to your question, but. I feel like the solutions need to be somewhere around that. Somewhere around incentive, right? Because that's so much incentive comes out of that process. Yeah, and the, and what we're rewarded for. I mean, we are rewarded for what we produce, but we are worth more than what we produce as humans and we're worth more than what we produce as academics. There's many facets of what we can offer to the academy and to society as a whole that are more than just how many papers we've published or what type of grant money have we brought in and mm -hmm. so changing the reward structures I think is a critical ingredient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. one area we haven't really touched on yet that I'd love to briefly touch on and then we have questions coming in that I'd love to take but is you know, we even focus on, on ourselves as faculty and instructors and staff and, and administration, but then there's students. And there's students who, you know, Jason and I were talking, at least and I were talking beforehand about our kids and how they're watching everything all the time. We are modeling constantly to our students ways of being in the academy and future lives in the academy. Um, Margarita, you, you have spoken eloquently about vocation and how the purposes for which we engage in the academy really impact our behavior day to day. For, for you, what does it look like to, to have pressure over here as, as a, an instructor and a director and a scholar, and to know that you're facing students constantly? How do you regulate being authentic with them, but also not accidentally painting a poor picture of, of what it's like to be, to, to, to be who we are in, in higher ed? Well, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things I was jotting down as we were talking earlier, listening to everyone, is the importance of being honest with our students about what our lives are really like. Um, you know, there's times that when I'm less busier than others, I still want to act like I'm busy all the time because this is what we do in the academy, right? There's a sense that we want to portray ourselves as being pushed to the max all the time, that there's a virtue in almost bragging. It's like a humble brag about how busy we are all the time. I finally realized that when people tell me that, they're playing with their kids, right? Um, people go out of their way to cover up what they do in their personal lives. And you sort of internalize, maybe it was Lisa who said this, or maybe it was you who said it at the beginning. You sort of internalize that like, better not talk to anyone about anything personal you spend your time on because they're gonna take it as a deficiency. I was told that. I was flat out told that. And I think that that's a problem. So I just think honesty, honesty about the struggles, but honestly, about the fact that we are human beings and we need personal time, we need exercise time, we need prayer time, we need time just to serve other people because that's an important part of being human. And to detach ourselves, this is the hard part for me. How do we detach ourselves once you have succeeded from telling students what you think they need to hear to get ahead versus telling students what you think they need to hear to be happy. And I have increasingly kind of just been more direct, like 
if you want to get on the tenure track and get a tenure job, here's a bunch of things that you're going to need to do. And along the way, you better be ready to make a lot of sacrifices. If the time comes that you don't think those sacrifices are for you, then it's a sign that this isn't your vocation. And there's another path for you. And I'm here to tell you that that path is okay. What I hear so much is that graduate students never hear from someone who they admire, a professor who they admire, that anything is okay other than full on pursuing the academic life. So I do tell students that, you know, this is the advice that's going to help you get tenure. And if it works for you, good, if that's what you want. And if you don't want that, that's okay. There is another life for you. This is another institutional change that I think has begun to happen. Seminars to help to, to help graduate students look for careers outside of the academy, how to, trans, how to translate your skills to work at a nonprofit, to work in a different kind of job at a university that may not be tenure track, right? How do we help people who are in graduate school prepare themselves for this? So I would just say honesty, um, love for that person. And I, I mean, I, I don't know, there's some mystery to this, right? That in, I believe that in every encounter face-to-face -face with another person, we're encountering a mystery, a person who has a dignity and a vocation we don't entirely know, but we're participating in this somehow. And so just knowing that each person is going to respond differently to circumstances and respond to their own calling um, and help them see. So honesty, respect for the mystery of each person and trying to give advice that fits what the person thinks their vocation is, not what we want them to become. Mm -hmm. That's very eloquently put, Margarita. Thank you. Other thoughts on on that? I have a, I have a few, but I want to open it up here. You can go ahead, Jason. I was just going to agree with a lot of what Margarita was saying, especially the honesty, or I would also call it transparency. Um, um, aspect is such a huge part of how I try to engage in my relationships with my mentees. I think it's such a critical component to be honest and transparent about kind of the realities of what my life is like, what having the goals that they have might require them to do, or, you know, how can I help them navigate their career paths, depending on what their goals are, just being as open and honest as possible, I think really is the best way that we can be advocates for our students. Mm -hmm. And I just want to underscore, it's, it's so easy to say that this, to say that. And yet you know, I, I know that the three of you know how hard it can be to practice that. I mean, as an instructor myself, I remember moments where I have a limited number of minutes in my 50 minute class section here. There's a lot to, 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 to cover or, or skill sets. I want them really engaging in and working on together. And I am rushed. I'm tired. Um, a student brings something up and my inclination is to put my head down and, and keep, and keep going. Uh, and to, I think there's also an inclination among, among individuals who teach who are not as comfortable standing in front of an audience that that curtain needs to stay, that this sort of Wizard of Oz here metaphor here, that the curtain needs to stay closed, that teaching is a performance and I can't let people see that I might be wrong or, or that my lesson plan is derailing here because I have a great question or a terrible question. Um, letting students see some of that, I think can, can matter and letting your colleagues hear that you're really struggling with an idea and don't know where to turn to, that this book you just published, um, it looks nothing like you thought it was gonna look 10 years ago or five years ago, but you're still happy about it. I think those kinds of open conversations, I, I, as a grad student, I found very, very hard to find. And so I just wanna underscore that what you're saying is, is um, you know, I could be on the nose here and say heterodoxical, but, but it really goes against the, the grain, the cultural grain here where Margarita, as you said, if we're in a culture that tempts us to lie about our busyness, being transparent is very, very hard, very, very hard. 
but it can also be very freeing. I would just like to add a little, that Please. little point that having Please. that openness and that transparency, it's really, you know, it was so difficult for me to do when I started to talk about burnout and imposter syndrome, for example, this is one specific scenario, like my own struggles, admitting to people that I felt like an imposter, like that was incredibly, mm. incredibly difficult because I believed I really was. So here I am literally pulling back the curtain to show my true self, the imposter that I am, right? Like so scary. But once I did it, it was so freeing and so liberating. And so, I mean, really nothing but positivity came from it for me. I can't say that that will be everybody's experience. I was fortunate to have supportive people in my life who understood me and who listened and but it could could be a really freeing experience mm. yeah can I just add to that that I've also I've been really transformed by practicing gratitude for what the academic life does allow we we have more control over our daily schedules than anybody I know and this is true for students as well as for faculty. We're just not put on a rigorous schedule of meetings and expectations. Now this could be different maybe if you're a lab scientist or something, but I believe it's possible and very, very possible to pursue a life of meaning and purpose in the academy in part because we do set our own priorities and set our own schedule. So along with this kind of complaining, oh, we're always busy, I think that we kind of live in a time where we've kind of let a little bit of the nihilism creep into our own way of thinking about ourselves. that we don't practice gratitude, right? That whatever we have just isn't enough. And rather than just cultivating an attitude of just being thankful for what the day has allowed us, for what the day has brought, practicing gratitude every single day doesn't mean you don't acknowledge limitations or see your weaknesses. You can even be grateful for those. But starting off the day with gratitude rather than trying to control everything. And I do think that the life of the mind is a beautiful thing and having control over your schedule is a beautiful thing. Kyle, can I, can I make a quick application of that? Please, to, Jason, please. Um, just to the classroom setting. And again, I realize that for, uh, I wanna be sensitive to the junior faculty person where this might not quite uh, apply, but, but I just wanna observe that many of us have students who are highly anxious and perfectionistic and afraid of failure. And we tell them we want them to, you know, not worry about failing or to, to um, I want them to be intrinsically motivated. We want them to take risks and so on. But then when I think about how I've, how I'm often inclined to teach, I'm just mirroring the opposite of that. So one of the postures that I kind of naturally have when it comes to teaching in lots of areas of life is one of control. So I want, I want to get everything perfectly figured out, crystal clear for all of my students so that all they have to do is just sit there and receive. Um, but there's no space then for them to wonder or for them to uh, take risks. And there's no vulnerability on my part. Um, one of the things that, that, that we've seen over and over at the Intellectual Virtues Academy is students, when asked about how, the, how their school experience here is different from other schools they've attended, so many students will talk about, my teachers aren't afraid to admit what they don't know, or they aren't afraid to take risks, or they aren't afraid to um, just acknowledge their limitations. And I, so I think it can be, you know, the right time, right place, and so on. I think it can be, Lisa, as you described, liberating for us um, to sort of surrender some of the, the control, but I think it can also be liberating and inspiring for our students. They can see that acknowledging limitations is, is, is okay. Um, and and to, so to your point about modeling some of these things, I think the modeling of intellectual humility by academics for students can be incredibly powerful. Mm. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. Oh, so many, so many thoughts in my head. This is great. I, I would love to keep this up. Uh, we have questions from our audience and I want to make sure that we have time to sort of cover some of those. So thank thank you all three of you for, for laying out so many wonderful 
uh, thoughts here. And for that shift towards application and modeling, I think that's it's really important to think about how can I start doing this tomorrow, right? Or, or, or tonight. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, so one question while we're still sort of on this topic of, of particular virtues to explore, one question here is, David Brooks distinguishes resume virtues from, from eulogy virtues, which by which I think he, this is a, a famous essay, which he's talking about uh, those deeper, more impactful, meaningful, uh, significant virtues that can define our lives uh, from the things that we have to get done in, in, in higher ed, right? Do you contemplate legacy, which I mean impact on the world, as a state of mind that transcends the bean counting to which we in academia are so often susceptible. I'll ask that again. The panelists contemplate legacy, impact on the world, as a state of mind that transcends the bean counting to which we are in the academia so often susceptible. Thoughts on, on that? Well, honestly, part of me thinks that it's not very humble to think about the legacy that you leave, you're just supposed to leave a legacy. But I will confess that a student asked me recently about the progress on one of my research topics and why I wasn't doing ethnographic field work this summer in Haiti or Cuba or Central America like I used to. And what came out of, what came out of my mouth was, I wanna leave a legacy through my teaching and I have emphasized a different set of priorities now, and it's not practical to do the kind of time intensive research that I once did. Mm -hmm. So I have become content with publishing less and spending more time on leading Scala and really trying to shape the lives of my students because I have tenure and I'm in an institution that supports mentoring and teaching. And so I did say to him, you know, I'm a couple of years away from 50, probably the brightest student I ever taught who David Brooks wrote about in the New York Times or tweeted about when this young man died at 26 of cancer. And he said, this young man had the resume virtues and the eulogy virtues. But what the pandemic has shown me that whether you're 26 or 46 or 56 or 66, none of us know how long we're gonna be here. And so what I think David Brooks is calling us to do is to think about Yes, we should spend some time thinking about the legacy that we want to leave and the best legacy we can leave. I don't really think is our research. It is our impact on the lives of other people and it is the service that we do. And so we can't like just add legacy to another task that we're going to conquer in this coming year. But I think it's a mindset. It's a mindset shift to think about what would I do today if I had if if I knew I had limited time, you know, what really is going to be the biggest impact that I can have. And it's through loving other people and serving other people um, that I think we leave the greatest legacy. Great, thank you, Margarita. And I think at least for people in my field or what I hope eventually my research program will be is that sometimes our research can be directly helping other people in service of improving people's lives. A lot of research in psychology looking at interventions to improve depressive symptoms or to, you know, um, improve mother-child relationships, things of that nature where, you know, people's research is having that direct impact in a way that I think can then perhaps merge together those seemingly dis um, disparate goals. Mm. I'd like to actually uh, pivot to another question that's related to that. And Jason, please feel free at some point we want to re respond to the prior question as well. Um, related to research, someone asks, how, <clears throat> excuse me, how do you think that the pressure to publish uh, the limited job market and, and, and burnout, sort of a, a, a related Gordian knot here around research, how do you think it affects the quality of research in terms of level of bias, scientific integrity, uh, and any ideas for solutions? As you think, it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, we have a, a piece on the blog that just came out that talks about 
the way that academia is is set up to require certain modes of research and publishing in certain journals and how that process sort of slots graduate students into certain frameworks where you have to be doing the research that a particular lab is, is exploring or that your advisor is, is tackling if you want to get a leg up. And that kind of seems to intersect a bit with Lisa, your comment about junior faculty too, that how much humility can you practice when the research is just requiring something of you, right? I can just speak from my personal experience, I guess, you know, for me, and I think for a lot of assistant professors at research intensive universities, feel like you're on a never ending treadmill that's just going faster and faster and faster. And somehow you need to keep up. And, you know, for me, at least, you know, I can remember distinctly in graduate school, and my postdocs, just the love I had for science and the passion that I would feel when I would talk about my ideas and have conversations with my mentors and just this excitement that I had. And that fire really diminished to a <laughs> smaller, smaller and smaller burn over time because you're just running on this treadmill over and over and over again. Now, I think though, you know, does that decrease the quality of publications? Does that impact the quality of our science? I'm not sure. I think that's an empirical question in and of itself. Um, but I, at least from personal experience can speak more to the, I don't know, I guess psychological ramifications perhaps of that and how that can impact the, I don't know, passion that you might feel about whatever projects that you're working on, feeling yeah. they're more externally rather than internally driven. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think, I think it can affect also the, the, the projects that one chooses to work on in the first place. And, and so, uh, you know, on that point, I, I would just encourage people that are in the early stages of their career to the extent that this is possible and consistent with other constraints and needs, um, really doing what you can early on to find areas of research that you are intrinsically interested in and curious about and sort of hitching yourself to, to, to those wagons. Um, because even, even if you're working on things that you're passionate about, as the question itself um, indicates, you're still going to be pressured to think about it in ways that are, that are probably not deep enough and slow enough and rich enough. Um, so so to, to try to limit those forces a little bit, I do think it's important as early on in one's career as possible to try to figure out what, what, am, I, what am I really interested in? And to what extent can I make that an area of my uh, focus and 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 research? Hmm. Jason, I'd love to to ask you, as someone who who is is uh, an expert and is published in intellectual character, intellectual virtue, which which is a a topic that doesn't receive warm reception everywhere in, in the academy. What what was your your story? Uh, it strikes me that that you must have had some interesting experiences finding people to explore this topic with and <laughs> drumming interest up. And so, you, you know, what, what, what were you practicing to, to, to well, get, you, get you did call that right. Because uh, <laughs> I, I, that, that is sort of what I just recommended to, to others it does happen to be my own story. And it, and it, it, there's an element of luck in the sense that when I, when I picked up one of very few books on virtue epistemology in 1998 when I was just starting graduate school and read a few pages and immediately thought, oh, this, this combines my interest in ancient ethics and epistemology. This is, I, I actually read the first chapter and, and said at that time, oh, this is what I'm going to write my dissertation on. And here I am 25 <laughs> years later and I'm still, but I, I was lucky in that, um, in that this was a largely unexplored field at the time. Hmm. And so there was a lot of work to be done, but it was challenging because there weren't a lot of other people doing it. And I did have to kind of twist the arm of, of my advisor to, to, to read some of this with me and talk about it with me. So, so it, is, it is challenging to do that, but I'll, I'm so glad that I did because um, 
uh, uh, it's it is a great blessing to be able to think and write and teach about things that I am fundamentally and deeply passionate and curious about. Like that's that goes a significant way toward uh, making my life uh, good and one that I want to be living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear, I hear cur- courage there. Sure. Uh, and and curiosity that that really matters. Uh, to to take a quick moment as moderator to share my own story. I mean, I my background is is Brit lit and British literature and Shakespearean literature. And yeah, I I I I did research and publications that I'm that I'm happy with on on the intersections of of Shakespeare and and religious belief. But to know to know what one's fault to no fault of my advisors and my committee of, of anybody I, I i lay the blame nowhere but on myself if i had pushed and been a little more courageous and saying no I'd, I'd like to write and talk about this aspect of religious faith uh, i wanted to write a bit a bit more personally about religious faith i probably would have written something that i'd be happier with and i you know i'm okay saying that in public and and recorded and on youtube someday here because I, I think it matters that as you just said, um, really, really pushing, thinking tactically about why you're writing, why you're you're publishing, what your end goals are, but looking to really find those sources of inquiry and modes of inquiry that matter to you uh, can really make a difference for, for, I mean, you just use, I think you said a good life, right? Happiness, uh, fulfillment, um, it, it matters. Yeah, I would to say, again, listening to Jason and then also to your comment just now, Kyle, I mean, I wanted to, again, point to the book that I mentioned earlier, John Henry Newman's The Idea of a University. What's ended up happening in the last 40 years or so is that most faculty simply don't know of what the original mission of the university was, the integration of fields of knowledge, the development of moral character, the promotion of the common good. It's really been kind of shifted to hyper-specialization and career professionalization. And I think that, yes, the secularization, the removal of theology and faith and worship from campuses has been part of it. But I think also part of it is, frankly, an American pragmatist, scientistic push that kind of the real measure of truth, as John Dewey would say, is scientific progress. And so, I I just think that a lot of the bigger questions that we're talking about, like we can talk about a virtue here and a virtue there, but this conversation is happening in a context where the original mission of the university has really shifted in the last 50 years. And I think in my conversations with faculty and students, a lot of them wish that there was a place for conversations about faith journey, for for their own faith journeys, for for talking about theological and philosophical questions, questions of meaning and purpose, the basic existential human questions. This is why I think universities really need to return to a liberal arts understanding, which is not just about a a kind of a certain set of texts, but an understanding of knowledge itself as pointing to a transcendent truth, to a higher order, and that the specializations that we pursue are wonderful because they correspond to small t truths that ultimately come together in a beautiful fashion. And I just think that so many people pursuing the life of the mind have never really studied the the history of the university or looked at these competing models, the scientific research university, the social justice university, City, the liberal arts mission of education. And so that's why I think these kind of foundational questions that we're talking about tonight are extremely important and recovering what the mission of the university once was so that people don't, like me, get a PhD in sociology and discover there's a field called virtue ethics after I have a PhD. Like, how, how did that happen? Sorry, I was muted. Children in the background. Uh, you know, there's so many things to respond to there, but I'm drawn back to Lisa's comment about transparency and authenticity. Uh, that that we need university structures that that uh, that don't punish or limit people who want to speak about how they view the academy, how they view the university, uh, why they are doing what they are 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 doing, um, and why they are called to do what they do. Uh, I think that really that really matters. I'd like to ask 
one more question here. This is an interesting one. So to shift shift the conversation a bit, we kind of focus on humility, but I'd like to just take a moment to land on curiosity again. Uh, HXA is all about curiosity and uh, encouraging the environments that allow students and scholars and faculty to pursue the boldest, most authentic versions of the questions they want they want to ask. So this is a question from the audience. When discussing ideas or, or, or being curious, maybe we can add authentic, is it possible to go too far? Uh, I frequently think of the quote typically credited to Carl Sagan, it pays to keep an open mind, but not so open your brains fall out. Um, what are the limitations here? Where, where can we go too far in curiosity and humility and authenticity? And what, what advice might we have for people who are, who are looking to pick these practices up moving forward? If, if it's okay, I mean, I think there's some obvious things that we oughtn't be curious about. Where, um, um, I, I think the, um, the the specific point about open-mindedness is is an is an interesting one, and I don't have a a great answer for it, but I think it's a pressing question. Um, are there views that we shouldn't be open-minded about? Um, if so, where where do we draw that line? And what do we do about the fact that we're most of us probably hardwired to draw that line um, um, more quickly than we should? Uh, hmm. I, again, I, I, I think that the simple answer is, well, well, we should be um, open-minded to the extent that we uh, have good reason to think that doing so will further our, our epistemic aims or goals, get us closer to the truth and so on. Um, well, that might be right. I mean, it's hard to know when we've when we've got those reasons and when being open minded um, will further rather than inhibit some of our some of our intellectual aims. Mm. Yeah. Great points. Thank you, Jason. Other thoughts on this? Lisa, I'm curious to hear from you about, I keep going back to junior faculty a lot because that's that's often where in a, in a panel about academic pressure where it's felt the most, right? Uh, you talk about transparency. What does it look like for a junior faculty member? Um, where Where is it safe, not, not safe as in shortcuts, but, but safe to be transparent about struggles? And where do you feel like maybe that's, that's a difficult practice that, that people should be careful with? Yeah, I think that's a really important question and yet simultaneously hard to answer because mm -hmm. different departments, different universities have different practices, different groups of people, some of which may be more or less receptive. So for example, I'm in psychology, people probably on average talk about mental health more than in like, let's say computer science or something like that, just because it's within the field that we're all, you know, regularly studying. It's a part of the classes we're teaching. And so there may just be different environments, even within academia that shares this, of course, broader culture, but the subcultures I think can vary so much that it really could depend a lot on what subculture are you a part of? Now, that being said, I do think the broader culture does make it difficult for junior faculty to share these types of, um, to share struggles or to share any type of vulnerability. That doesn't mean it's impossible. And I certainly don't mean that that, that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. I just think that it can be difficult to do it. And there are certainly many reasons I could understand why people would hesitate to do it. Mm -hmm. as a junior faculty member. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe there's a, maybe there's a, a, a implicitly a message or a signal there to certainly to, to provosts and deans, but I'm thinking about chairs of departments and those who are really overseeing the local cultures at the university, because the university is just so, so localized that cultivating cultures that are okay with transparency across across the board where, where authenticity of transparency is not a privilege of having achieved tenure but is, yeah. is, is in fact is, my dean who um recently did a, a state of the college address 
Mm-hmm. He, you know, we talked about earlier about modeling behavior and mo- modeling through example. He spoke about burnout during the state of the college and talked about how, you know, he recognizes how prevalent is it is among faculty and that things aren't just, you know, rosy, <laughs> everything's fine. We're just back to the way things were before the pandemic. And he was really honest about it. And from my perspective, it was incredibly refreshing and exactly what I think we need in our in our leadership is that just honesty, the realism, the the uh, w- uh, um, willingness to engage in those conversations, and I hope it then made people feel more comfortable sharing their own experiences, knowing that the dean is kind of setting the tone, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I don't know to what extent this could become like a real, you know widespread practice, but I've been really blessed to have mentors who are emeritus faculty. Um, Mm. One of them, a dear colleague who recently passed away, Albert Rabateau, he wrote a book called Slave Religion. That was his dissertation writing about the conversion of Christianity among slaves and all the debates around that. He also published, well, he gave a talk where he talked about his own experience of burnout in the academy and how it actually ripped his family apart. And he made this kind of public kind of, you know, statement about it that was published as a small book. And I got to know him um, when he was already an emeritus professor. I, I also happened to live on the same street as the historian Peter Brown from Princeton University, Mm -hmm. who's now in his mid eighties. And so these two scholars who had retired, but gave me their time one-on-one to help me pose these kind of basic questions. Why did I get into this to begin with? What did, what was the academy like 50 years ago? What was the academy like when I started? How have I shifted, right? So to the extent that, again, one of the things I'm grateful for living in a university campus, you might just walk down the street and run into Peter Brown or Al Rabito. And I said, hey, you know, could I have coffee and just talk to you about your career? And the wisdom of our elders, I think also is not a strength of American culture, looking at our elders for wisdom. And I, again, I don't know to what extent emeritus faculty across the board could be involved in, especially helping faculty now at maybe at a slightly, you know, those who are past tenure are really like, okay, now I've got the prize, what do I do? So maybe, and then those of us kind of passing that on to the students that are coming up um, behind us, you know, 10 or 20 years younger. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I could, I wish I could talk all night. Uh, It is, it is 8.15. We need to close down, but I can't think of a better, of a better uh, set of comments to close this, this evening down than really, just again, signaling to our audience here that transparency and modeling and changing our, our own practices bit by bit as we can uh, in ways that build and strengthen our relationships and help others to, to practice the same authenticity and transparency. Changing our cultures where we are is, is, is a first step and, and, a, and a great place to, to get started tomorrow. Uh, so, I want to thank our panelists for being here tonight. This was a, a wonderfully rich conversation. Thank you for representing your disciplines and your own professional lives so well uh, for sharing so much of yourselves. And uh, I know our, our audience is so thankful. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate it. Thank you.